everyone, it's Eugene, and how are you doing today? Welcome to another episode of Forensics Talks. This is episode 85, and my guest today is Lori Peters-James. We're going to be talking about cyber trafficking and a lot of issues surrounding trafficking, the dark web, uh, a whole number of different topics. But before we do that, I just got to make a couple of quick announcements, and that is that one, that there is a Cloud Compare course that's coming up on June 27 and 28th. So if you are somebody working with 3D technologies and uh, laser scanning or mobile data and that sort of thing, um, you may find this a really interesting course, and that's because Cloud Compare is also free. Uh, it's a free uh, uh, program that you can download, and it does a whole number of different things. So if you are interested, you can go ahead and just uh, click on the link, visit the website, and uh, jump on in. Uh, the other thing that I was going to mention here is that uh, some of you know that I am uh, working on some mobile iPhone scanning uh, with Recon 3D, and that is something that's used for crime scenes, it's used for crash scenes, and people are using it for documentation. And next week, I haven't announced it just yet, but I'll make it formal now, I will be doing a webinar probably on Friday and there is a new version that I'm releasing. It's got some new features and things like that. So if this is something that you're interested in and you're looking to um, you know, use your iPhone or with the LiDAR sensor for forensics purposes, then it may be interesting to you to jump on, but you'll find out more about that later on. Also, I just want to give a shout out to the people at the Canadian Society of Forensic Science conference that's going on not too far from here. It's at the uh, Ontario uh, Tech University. And so there's a whole number of people that I know that are there. So just want to say hi to those people. Some of the uh, intern students we had did some presentations just in the past uh, couple of days. So uh, congratulations to them. So uh, we're going to get started here. My guest today is Lori Peters James, and she is a specialist offender profiler whose primary function is to assess, analyze, and predict criminal behavior. She has a strong background in psychology, criminology, intelligence, and law, and she's been an advocate for cyber awareness and training. As the Chief Operation Officer at Cyber Ready Consulting Services, Lori's been involved in the profiling, investigation, detection, and prosecution of cyber crimes, and she also does training for police in cyber trafficking, uh, discussing issues, um, and of course, the, the large rise of cyber trafficking, uh, tra cyber trafficking most uh, recently, the devastating impacts and potential solutions. And so let me bring her in here. There she is. Hey, Lori, how are you? Hey, Eugene. Good to be here. I'm All well, right. thank you. And yourself. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thanks for being here all the way from South Africa. And I think you are near somewhere in between, I think, Johannesburg and Pretoria or something like that, right? That's correct. Yes, Centurion. Uh, uh, great, great. Um, uh, also, something else I didn't say, which I normally say, is for the folks who are going to be watching, uh, let us know where you're from. I, it's always interesting to know where people are watching from, uh, you know, around the globe. So, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, make sure that you put them into the comment section and I'll be monitoring that. So Lori, I want to start with you and how you got started and how you found your way into cyber ready consulting. So can you tell me a little bit about your background? Yes, sure. So, um, I started off my career strangely in the South African air force, um, and then moved into the department of transport as an air traffic controller. Um, and then back into the intelligence world. And then I studied law and criminology. Um, yeah, and then I found myself at a loss in, in Botswana. Um, I, I got married and we moved to Botswana, where I spent uh, 10 years. And that was where my interest was peaked in, in cybercrime because Botswana, with the death penalty, has a very low murder rate. Mm. So there were no serial killers to hunt down, unfortunately. <laughs> so we had to change direction. And um, so I moved into the financial crime and, and then the cyber world. And then we started to have some cyber conferences. Um, of course, it was a big issue. People were really desperate for knowledge. And I built on the cyber from there. Um, started developing profiles of dark psychology, cyber criminals, uh, sexual online sexual predators, cyber bullying and the management of cyber bullying cases and then cyber stalking and harassment. And we've developed a whole bunch of tools around that. Um, and then, as I said, I started Cyber AT in 2019. And there I changed the focus slightly away from cyber because I moved back to South Africa in 2020. 
So now we deal with all aspects of, of crime. But what's very interesting is that even your old fashioned crimes, uh, things like murder, like rape, your victim selection is now often done in the cyber world. So, um, you know, the cyber is now impacting even on, on, on the common law crimes. And uh, it's a very interesting field. It's a new field. It's a developing field um, that together with the cyber security aspects, um, you know, while, while the rest of IT is uh, retrenching people, uh, cybersecurity is employing people and it's growing and we're looking at about 3.7 million jobs going to be opening up now between now and, and 2025. So mm. it really is an exciting and interesting field. Yeah, for sure. And I, I don't remember how we met exactly. I think it might have been through like LinkedIn or something online, but I do recall we had a really good conversation. I think the first time we spoke on on the phone and we were talking about, you know, things like uh, the issues surrounding kids with like Facebook and social media and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and, and so I think that's that's what got me interested in speaking to you and having you as a guest here. Just uh, you brought up a lot of really interesting points. So you've obviously been studying this topic for for quite some time. Um, let me start by asking you uh, just in with respect to uh, cyber trafficking itself. So how would you define cyber trafficking and, you know, what are there different kinds? Yes, um, well, they, they are and they aren't. So let's start with the definition of, of trafficking in persons, because that's what we're actually looking at. We're looking at the cyber act, uh, the aspect, the cyber aspect of trafficking in persons. So what is trafficking in persons really? Well, the first thing that you have to have is an act. So th that would be the act would be any person who delivers, recruits, transports, transfers, harbors, sells or exchanges or leases or receives a person. Um, anywhere in the world, really, because it is a global phenomenon. And then the means that you have to look at is how does it happen? So it's either through things like, and I mean, this isn't an extensive list, a threat of harm, the use of force or other forms of coercion, the use uh, of the abuse of vulnerable people, fraud, deception, abduction, kidnapping, the abuse of power, the direct or the indirect giving or receiving of payments or benefits to obtain consent from a person or having control over a person with a person that's in authority over another person. And then also the indirect or direct giving or receiving of payments for compensation or reward or benefit or any other advantage. So that's how it's done. And then the, 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 the next important thing to look at is... Um, how and that, that that this is mainly for the purpose what is the purpose of this it's for the purpose of the exploitation of that person be it online in person through selling through through bondage through um through through tra through sex trafficking through labor uh, trafficking through organ trafficking or any of these um types of things and when we put the cyber into it it's the it's it's, it's actually committing these acts using it or or a computer okay yeah because normally when we think about trafficking we you just sort of a, a stereotypical image that maybe many people have in their heads of you know somebody standing on the corner of the road and you know the pimp is close by or something and you know, they're, they're, they're selling, you know, young kids or something for prostitution or, or something like that. But now it's um, it's completely changed. And so how how prevalent is cyber trafficking globally? It's a global problem. But how big of a problem is it? It is it is a global problem. Um, you know, there is a trafficking ring in basically every single town in on the globe almost today. So it's monumental. In, in value, um, trafficking per, in persons is an industry worth approximately $150 billion. Um, whereas if you look at the entire airline industry, it's worth a profit of $22 billion. So that'll put it in a little bit of perspective for you. Mm -hmm. So it is huge and it's growing. And, you know, as long as there are perpetrators out there, looking for these services, it's going to continue to grow. Yeah, for sure. Um, when it comes to uh, things like the kinds of people that make up, because, uh, you know, you said it's organized, right? So it, it, it's organized. It's a form of organized crime. But what is the makeup of the 
the cyber traffickers are, are they are they typically men are there women involved are they young males uh what what is the typical makeup so the typical makeup of a good cyber trafficking organization you generally have a woman somewhere near the top interestingly enough and these women have often been groomed and gone through at the the system as um as victims at some point so although the pimps and the muscle is male usually um, the person that's there to keep the victims in line is often female and a person that's been previously trafficked because they really understand all the challenges then you have involved in these rings because it's organized crime you've got the money launderers you've got the um, doctors lawyers uh, people people that make counterfeit documents um, the transport networks if they're transported but uh, with cyber trafficking you don't need to transport the victim you can traffic them from inside of their own homes which we saw a big um, increase in in, in in during COVID because kids were locked in their homes with their parents and their siblings and they were trafficked online by their own parents who were looking for an income and desperate for incomes so yeah it's it's, it's huge it can happen to anyone uh, and anybody can be a trafficker uh, you will walk past a trafficker in the street and you won't know that it's a trafficker um, and that's what makes them so dangerous yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting, though, you saying, you know, like you have lawyers and doctors involved. These are people who should be helping and serving the community. But you're saying that they're involved to so doctors to make sure that I guess they keep the the, the victims safe and keep them producing money or, or doing what they have to do. Well, you know, you have instances, especially with child sex abuse victims, where the doctor will be there to stitch the child up directly after they've been abused so that they can be put to work again as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we also have things like the NGOs that are involved. There are police officers that in, are involved. Now, of course, I'm in South Africa and um, our police force is, is, is a problem. We've had a case where a victim ran to the police in Sunnyside in Pretoria and the police trafficked her back to the trafficker for sex. Um, so, you know, anything goes depending on where you are and, and what the challenges are in that country. And, and South Africa faces a massive corruption problem. Yeah. Um, and they're in, in league with a lot of the organized criminals. So one doesn't ever want to put down the police because please God, they, there are many, many fantastic police officers really trying to make a difference. But unfortunately, you know, we do have the bad apples as well. Yeah, no, I, I, that's that's everywhere, I guess. Um, in terms of the laws, like so, when it when it comes to trafficking and cyber trafficking, um, like in specifically, I, I'm I don't know how well versed you are with laws around the world, or if they're very similar everywhere. But in South Africa, for example, like what are some of the laws that pertain to cyber trafficking? Well, we have the Sexual Offences Act that covers it. And then we've also got a specific law around human trafficking. So we have a, a trafficking act and that deals with um, the act, the protection of the victims, um, what to do, um, the sentences and, and, and so on. It's very comprehensive. South Africa has some of the best legislation in the world around trafficking. And that's why we're able to prosecute it so effectively. Um, Incidentally, and, and very interestingly, South Africa has the highest sentence in the world for trafficking. Um, we had a case where a young girl was um, trafficked by her aunt and, the and, and her daughter, part of the family, brought into the country under the guise of being educating her. Um, she was then trafficked online specifically by these two perpetrators. Um, and eventually, after the prosecution, we managed to secure uh, 19 life sentences and 45 years. And that is the highest sentence globally handed down in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a trafficking case. Yeah, um, so I'm not South sure. Africa is pretty good. Yeah, South Africa is pretty good when we when we can get a conviction, we do. And we're also very, you know, our hawks are 
are, are getting there on the investigation side. They really, we have some dedicated officers and we work in league with Interpol, with um, UNODC. We've got a lot of help from US Homeland Security. The US Secret Service assists with the training of, of our Hawks. So there's a, there's a giant effort to do something about the trafficking at least. What now was there a you know, problem? We also at Cyberity, we train, we, we train the law enforcement as well to um so that that also gives them a little bit of a, a heads up and we do it very reasonably to assist um the community because it's in everybody's best interest to combat this crime the the fact that the laws are um more aggressive let's say in south africa was it because it was a problem there more than other places Look, South Africa, because of its strategic position and because that we have a number of large harbors, South Africa became a, tra a hub for trafficking. So the victims would come down through South Africa, be trafficked through South Africa, held in South Africa and loaded onto cargo ships in our harbors and then trafficked to places like China and the Middle East and so on. Because South Africa has very good trade relations with, with countries like China, so our ships aren't searched. And um, that opens the door to, to, to making us a corridor and a hub for trafficking, and it has been that way. So countries like Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, they're all landlocked. They have to get to a harbor somehow. Um, so they'll either use Mozambique um, or they'll use South Africa. And South Africa is bigger. And um, as I said, we, you know, it's, it's, it's a country that's facing many corruption issues. So there's the possibilities of, of bribing your way through it or at least working with the powers that be to actually traffic these victims basically uninterrupted. Okay. Well, how do you, um, like, for, uh, for example, when I think about trafficking especially with like young children I, I don't know why but places in asia pop into my mind and it's just sort of maybe because of what i've seen on the media and even in the past week or two what i've seen you know stories on youtube and things like that um you know you, you'll see people that travel on these vacate these so-called vacations and they head up over to some asian country um you know to to, to do whatever they they have to do so are there certain places in the world where you know, trafficking of young children is, you know, rampant. And then where, uh, where in the world would you say is probably the, the biggest location of the largest country for cyber trafficking? Well, America is the largest buyer of trafficked victims. Mm. So that would make them the hub. Yes, they are markets in 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 the middle east and the far east um but these victims are often sold through onto american buyers or american buyers visit these countries in order to abuse these these traffic victims um and they're sold online or auctioned online um it's 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 very simple it's it's, it's very interesting when you look at the recruitment and the sale so we see a couple of different categories here. So they're either recruited online and sold online. They could be recruited in the real world and sold online or recruited online and sold in the real world or recruited online and sold both online and in the real world. Hmm. So it's very interesting. Um, you always have to follow the buyer, follow the money, because the, the country that where you have the, the most buyers is the country that will be the hub and that is the usa okay so what is what is a typical way that you know a a predator goes from a very innocuous post or a text message or something like that all the way to you know getting these you know children to perform sexual acts on camera like what what is how does that how, what's that process like well, okay, let's use one of our South African cases as a, as a case study here. So this was, this was an interesting one. We had a chap named Kent Locke in South Africa. He was a youth pastor. So Mr. Locke, um, in his position that he was in, he was also a very good photographer. He, did, he was a surfing photographer. So he would uh, upload, well, upload a... a um, a page where he would capture data, which looked like Instagram. Then he would send this link to the kids 
um, that the girls in 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 the in the in the church. He would then tell the girls, please, would you go and vote for my photograph? They would land on this Instagram page. They'd put in their logging details and they would just think the link didn't work. So they'd go. Meanwhile, he had now grabbed all their credentials from this page. He would then at night log in as one of the young girls and then solicit the boys to send him images, which they did. You know, boy, young boys don't think too well. And the more we try and teach them, don't send images of your face and your and your private areas in the same photo. They don't learn. But anyway, um, so they would do that. And then he would ask for more material and he would ask for more material. But this as the girl, as and these boys would oblige. And then finally, the, the kids would realize this has gone too far. This was now becoming really lewd and they were afraid. And he would tell them, uh, then, uh, you cannot go to the police because given what you've already posted, the police will arrest you. So they were terrified. So who did they go to? The youth pastor for help. So they went off to Mr. Locke in his capacity as the youth pastor who then um, say to them, well, you know what, you don't really have a choice here. There's, there's nothing, nobody's going to help you. So please go and even if you need to use my, um, my, my laptop, um, go up to my study and masturbate and do what you have to do. And then, um, you know, hopefully they'll go away. And then he would take the material and sell it um, or, or trade it because these pedophilic um, these pedophilic tendencies, these people with these tendencies, they tend to trade material. So when we do have an arrest of this nature, um, where we have this type of perpetrator, which is a cyber trafficker, um, we often find that these cases are linked and we'll find the addresses and shared components of four to 5,000, um, maybe even more, up to 7,000, IP addresses from people that have tr traded this material. So it is it is interesting because this opens up the networks. And this is all being done. People think that it, this is on the deep web. It's not. This isn't deep or dark web. This is surface web. This is this is out and out trading. There's no dark web involved here. I mean, once you move to the dark web, it's a whole different ball game again. But yeah, this, is, was... this is surface web. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that, like, you know, this is all done right on, you know, if obviously Instagram, he's logging into their Instagram accounts and he's doing this all like right on the surface. So there's there's nothing very hidden. And so, so who, yeah. who caught so on in that case? That most, most trafficking is like most cybercrime. It starts with identity theft um, because they hide behind what we call the veil of anonymity. And, the, and most of these perpetrators become quite skilled at hiding behind this veil of anonymity and actually hiding their identities, um, but but Mr. Locke, he did, he didn't he didn't have to. <laughs> he captured the data the the credentials of the girls and then he exploited the boys. How, how so was that, he found that, out? And that's 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 fairly common. Uh, one of the chil the children actually made a report, uh -huh. and then U.S. Homeland Security did the digital forensics for for this. Uh, in, 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 in cooperation with the South African police, which was fantastic. And that's what I say, South Africa's really jacked and the relationships between these entities are, are solid and they, and, and they do get assistance. And this is what these people don't understand. Um, you know, when you traffic, it doesn't matter from where you traffic. If you traffic from South Africa, if you traffic from, from Finland or you traffic from Asia, it doesn't matter. Once you upload those images onto American server, you can be prosecuted under American law. So mm. if you upload onto a Google server or a Facebook server or an Instagram server, you're uploading onto an American server. And then it's fairly easy for law enforcement to get the subpoenas. And in fact, you can be extradited to stand trial in America. I was going to bring up a slide and it was something that you sent me, but I think it's an important point and it has to do with the actual value. Like there, there, there has to be some monetary benefit into all this because otherwise people wouldn't actually risk this. But the slide you sent me was asked, uh, was actually uh, with respect to Canada, uh, which is obviously where, where I live yes. and looking at some of the values of, 
you know, what you can sell somebody for or profit in a week or, or a month or a year. So um, is, is this yeah. similar around the world or are there places where people get more or less money? It's more profitable or less profitable? I, I think it doesn't. It, it's it's pretty standard. Um, you know, depending on if you're in the poorest countries in Africa, it will probably be less. Um, but for the U.S. market, the Canadian market, the Mex uh, maybe Mexico might be less. I think you have to look at the value of the currencies. But the, uh, for Canada, that would be pretty accurate, and that's dealing in children. You know, from the ages of 12 to 25. The more um, out, out, outlandish or the more bizarre the, the sexual favors that are requested, the higher the rates will be. So if you're dealing with very young children or you're looking for victims that are between the ages of two and four, for example, you'll pay more. Um, the unfortunate thing is that these children have a very short shelf life. Um, they rarely survive longer than two years. A working life um, and then they are either sold into the labor trafficking markets not the sex trafficking markets because they're no longer suitable or they're simply murdered for organs okay now what about the we talked about how much they make but what about the transfer of money like so where does the, is that in like is there a role that crypto uh, currencies play here or is it even not even that complicated people are doing things over PayPal credit cards or whatever. How how is the transfer yeah, of money happening? It's, it's it's not that complicated. So it's either cash, which is laundered through cash businesses and casinos and, and these sorts of things. Typical organized crime setup, nothing different. Okay. Um, so either <coughs> you know all your general money laundering um, techniques will work when you're dealing with cash. Um, alternatively, I mean this is organized crime. So they're either laundering the money through business. Um, there's the the entire crypto market, um, so it's it's vast. Um, if they're trading on the on the dark web, then generally it's crypto. Okay. Um, question about obviously going through the pandemic. So was was there a now? Now that I would say the pandemic is is well over. Is there has there been a reduction in cyber trafficking? Was it just something that got you know was because of the pandemic, or is it still sort of at a, at its all time high? No, it's still at its all-time high. Mm. Um, <clears throat> the thing is, although the pandemic is over, the financial effects of the pandemic are not over. They're not even nearly over. Um, I, I think we will still be seeing the effects of the pandemic for at least another five years. And that's if we don't get driven into another pandemic, which looks like it might be on the cards. Oh, no. Let's, <laughs> let's not go there. The, 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 <laughs> yeah, given the agendas of some of these people. But anyway, besides that. So we had a lot of problems with COVID because we had um, vulnerable societies literally with their freedom de deprived, locked up in houses. Many, many, many people lost their jobs. They became desperate. Um, the family, the the family locked up in the house was a source of income. They would simply turn one bedroom into a, a, a um, an area where they could perform sex acts on the children and film it and 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 start to traffic these kids that are at, from from the actual home. Of course, another problem was that law enforcement was severely stressed and curtailed during that time. The funding dried up because companies were struggling. So the, the, the funding for the NGOs dried up. The NGOs also were no longer mobile. So we had a lot of knock-on effects um, which were directly related to COVID. Um, and, and that's not going away because once a, a criminal finds a really easy way of making money, they're not going to stop just because the circumstance stops. Um, but you know, now the kids can go to school and they, they are allowed to, do, I mean, we're back to, let's say, normality with reference to that. But there's nothing to stop them uh, trafficking those children in the evenings or in the afternoons. Yeah. And they've learned the methodologies. They've invested in the technology and the lighting and everything else. They're not going to throw it away. <laughs> and they found a way to make money. <laughs> Yeah. I, I want to ask you about another case. Uh, it's, I guess it's the South African version of, of Jeffrey Epstein. Well, North America has Jeffrey Epstein and, and you had your own version of that. Um, but it's just this other guy who I believe is in prison now. He's probably not coming out 
anytime soon. Uh, is it Bernard Ackerman? Um, Ackerman. Ackerman. Ackerman, yeah. What can you tell me about him? So again, um, very much, well, very like Epstein, also traded in, in, in kids. Um, he actually had 740 cases brought against him. Um, the trial has been completed. He has been found guilty on multiple counts. Um, I'm not 100% sure if he's been sentenced. I'd have to check that. Um, but he's facing multiple life sentences. He'll never get out of prison. Um, again, you know, again, the this, this, this solicitation of, of, of very vulnerable victims. And this is what happens. Unfortunately, you know, it's although anybody can be trafficked, let's 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 be very clear. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your risk factors are, anybody can be trafficked. But the problem is is the vulnerable are targeted. It's and they're easy to exploit because of desperation. Yeah, so it's again, interesting. Yeah, you know, the recruitment of, of vulnerable victims and the sale of these victims online again these cases open up multiple avenues for investigation because of the sharing of the material so again this case also opened up a huge amount of ip addresses that are currently under investigation um increasing the trafficking uh, where, where investigators are looking at other members of the trafficking rings yeah it's interesting the i was reviewing the amanda todd case uh here in here in canada and uh you know, she, for those that don't know that, you know, basically a young woman, she's online and, you know, she ends up, she ends up flashing, you know, for the camera and just through, kidding. yeah. And then through, it, you know, the just embarrassment and shaming and uh, this one in particular individual, which wasn't in Canada, which was, I believe he in was the Netherlands. in the Netherlands. Yeah. He was Dutch, um, just kept after her no matter where she went. And, uh, yeah, but it it, it it was when I was l looking and reviewing the story, you know, she wasn't completely nude or whatever. It, yes, it was embarrassing or whatever, but that's not, I think, what got her. It was the stress of continuously being harassed and followed. And uh, um, yeah, like there was Tormented. nowhere for her to, yeah, nowhere for her to escape. So uh, in that case, it wasn't so much the act. It was the fact that she was vulnerable. Yes, and as this was was a cyber bullying case. But if you actually look at the facts of the case, that case could have been prosecuted as trafficking, because mm -hmm. she was targeted, recruited, um, and and terrorized and exploited, and for the purposes of exploitation. And that exploitation doesn't have to be monetary; it can be for sexual gratification. Um, so yes, the, the, that's a case that should have and could have been prosecuted as trafficking. And this is what we're doing in South Africa now. We're taking cases um, that would have been prosecuted as rape or would have been prosecuted as molestation or um, indecent assault or any of these types of cases. Um, and we are prosecuting them as trafficking. Because under South African law now, the law is this tight that if you own the trucking company that moves a victim, you can be prosecuted for trafficking. If you own a house where the victim is kept, you can be prosecuted for trafficking. You form part of the trafficking ring. Right. And that's what we have to do. We have to prosecute all acts involved in the trafficking as trafficking and not as 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 um as as the common or common crimes yeah and if we do that we're going to close it down fairly quickly yeah you'd hope so i'm going to bring up a question here from uh amber um she's asking how often are you invited to discuss the profiles of the buyers of those being trafficked the uh, labor or sex fairly often um it is it look we we've got various profiles that we do look at um, we look at the profiles of both, actually, the victim and the perpetrator. But, you know, there's some very specific personality tra traits that raise their heads over and over again. And one of these is the lack of empathy, complete lack of empathy. That victim to that trafficker is not a person. It's a commodity. Um, so they are seen as a commodity. They are treated as a commodity. 
they are exploited until they have no further use um, in the sex trafficking market as a commodity. And then a lot of these cases, they are murdered and their organs are once again sold as a commodity. So they, they have, there is no humanity in these people. And that's something that you have to bear in mind. These people do not view their victims as human. They view them as, as, um, as things to be, as, as, a, as a vessel to be ma for money to be made of them. Um, which is very, very sad. Um, but you're dealing with psychopathic type personalities. Um, in order to actually reach one of the primary, um, per, you know, traits of psychopathy is a complete lack of empathy. And most people involved in the trafficking trade have that complete lack of empathy. Yeah, you just, you know, you mentioned that, you know, they're using these victims. Uh, it's bad enough already, you know, for, for, for sex profit or whatever. But now, you know, when you said, they're actually murdering them for organs. Like that's absolutely, it's, that's a pretty dark place uh, to, to be at that. That's hard to imagine uh, that people can go that far. But uh, unfortunately I, I think, yeah, that's just the reality of what we're faced with in some places it's probably going to happen. Um, and there, again, there's, there's a market for that too, right. Uh, in terms of, and I think there was a, there's a graphic I'm going to look for here, but I believe you had something where it actually shows your, your body parts and what kind of money you can make on the body parts. Uh, I'm going to see if I can bring it up. Oh yeah. Here's one here. I'll, I'll bring it up here. And I, I don't, I'm not sure where you got this graphic from, but, um, what can you tell but, me? Yeah, about? that's quite an old one. So the value is a little bit higher than that now. Interesting. But yeah, yeah you okay. can see that um, <laughs> you, you're worth quite a bit of money. Um, you know, a heart now goes for really good money. Um, you know, up to $150,000 for a heart. Um, lungs, similar. So, yeah, once you start breaking down the human body, I mean, even today with, with organ transplants, even the skin is worth money. You know, they harvest the skin for skin transplants today. Wow. So it's not just the, the, the actual organs anymore. I mean, the skin is an organ, obviously, but even that's worth money. So, and your hair is worth money for to, to be made wigs out of. You know, everything has a price. Everything has a cost. And these people are only interested in that commodity market. I want to ask you about or start moving into the investigation of these types of crimes and the the role that the police have play and the kinds of tools that they have as well. So um, do the police, I mean, nowadays, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the police will often try to bait some of these people in the background, uh, you know, they're also hiding their, the police are hiding their own identity and, you know, pretending that they're maybe young women or something like that. But what kinds of tools or what kinds of ways are there that the police are investigating and trying to fight this type of crime? So, look, often what happens with a police investigation, it will lead you to a specific website. And once that perpetrator has been identified and arrested, um, often they will give up the credentials of that website. And then the police will take over and operate that website for a number of months and identify if everything that they can from that website before they shut it down. So they will actually become the operators of the website. And that's where you get the best information that you can get. I mean, obviously, they're also extremely powerful law enforcement forensics tools. They will take the they, they'll take the devices, they'll, they'll, they'll make um, copies of the of forensic copies of the devices it's very interesting when that happens I, um, it was something I learned from some of the forensics guys here they never reuse a hard drive so it cannot be used twice so every hard drive that's used for every dump is a brand new hard drive so the police here yeah, go through absolute mountains of hard drives um, you know, the problem in South Africa, and it's not a problem worldwide, is that they do lack resources. Um, but there are a number of really fabulous um, companies that will actually assist. So with the South African police, where, they, where there is a problem, we do have a cyber unit. 
but um, we don't have enough people to actually uh, deal with the amount of crime that 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 we deal that we have to deal with. So we're now looking at initiatives on how we can, in, 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 you know, sort of use the private sector to assist with 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 um, with this type of of work. And there are fantastic tools out there. If somebody wants to get into it, I mean, there's a fabulous investigative tool out there called Multigo. Um, a lot of the investigators use it. Um, there's another one called Traffic Jam, which is used to hunt um, traffickers. That's an AI tool. And of course, AI is going to be playing more and more of a role. Mm. If anybody wants to research that, I, I have sent you some links, which we're more than happy to, to share. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, because I am a criminologist, so I'm not a techie. I must be quite frank with you. I'm, 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 I work in a cyber company, but I'm not a techie. So we work um, very closely with a fantastic company, uh, which, a, which a girl runs, an, an American, um, named Alyssa uh, Gorbachev. And they have a company called Cyber Nightwatch that does our uh, operational uh, uh, send for us. So they will search and 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 look very carefully at everything. So we we work closely with them, and there are other organisations that do this. Um, we used to do a lot of work with Deliver Fund, um, but um, we found that Alyssa is 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 very very good at her job. So there are the you know if you do have a problem if you are stalked online or anything like that you can contact us at Cyberetti. And and we're more than happy to 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 share um, details with Cyber Nightwatch and and have that scraped for you. And there are millions of tools. Um, I have given you a list as well, which we can add as a link. Um, there are there are many 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 tools that you can use if you are interested in this field. And and also um, Alyssa does a lot. We do a lot of training together, and Alyssa does a lot of training as well on actually how to operate these tools and to upskill and empower people to use them. I mean, there's a tool for everything at the moment, literally everything. There's email scrapers, uh, Facebook login credential scrapers, Twitter scrapers, um, Multigo scrapes everything. There's cell phone trackers, um, you know, and that's not even talking about what law enforcement can actually do. I mean, Interpol has huge databases um, the UNODC has huge databases. So the forensic aspects are, are um, the resources that, that if, if governments and these organizations work together, we could, you know, there, there's, there's huge scope for closing down um, these operations. Yeah, I've got another question here, and I'm going to I'm going to bring it up here. But what are the challenges faced by child trafficking profilers in their efforts to dismantle networks in the global child sex trade? And what can individuals or communities do to support these efforts? Well, there's a lot that we can do. So one of the biggest problems, not only for profilers, but for law enforcement is is a lack of of resources for training. So that's that's a huge problem. Um, so anybody that's prepared to to help with resources or donate for training purposes to upskill the police, that's always necessary. The NGOs struggle with things like housing the victims that they they take back they they actually take off the streets. These people have to be cared for, housed, um, assisted. Statements have to be taken, trials, uh, visas have to be obtained when they have to testify. So, and then there's a the whole repatriation program. Profilers like myself, um, I think the main challenges that we face are the psychological challenges because we see a lot. Um, um, you know, you have to be very strong. Um, fortunately, I don't have that problem. I, I'm very, very good at compartmentalizing. But maybe that's because of, of the serial crime aspect. As a profiler, we specifically train that. Um, but also, again, uh, access to training, upskilling, um, working, building the relationships can be tricky, um, you know, because a lot of the profilers are not employed by the police, the criminologists. Um, so it's building those, those relationships and getting law enforcement to trust you 
because of course that's if you if your if your law enforcement doesn't trust you and doesn't want to work with you um it's very difficult to even offer to assist because you pushed sideways and in south africa criminology faces a lot of challenges because it actually isn't a, a professionalized uh, occupation it doesn't have professional status it's not under social work and it's not under law so um, there are challenges there, there as well but i'd say your every everyday challenges are just staying abreast of the technology making sure that you you because unfortunately we wake up today we have this technology the perpetrators wake up and they dream up another four things that they can do and use. So it's keeping track of the trends, really monitoring what is going on, staying abreast, staying strong, um, you know, looking after yourself physically and mentally um, so that you actually get up each day um, able to do the job um, and knowing that you can. And, um, you know, just uh, I think every day has a, has different challenges, but the biggest the biggest challenge that we do see is having to wade through hours and hours and hours and hours of of videotape where children are being abused and and the impact that that has on people can be quite severe. Yeah, you you brought up another point about um, the fact that there's no you saying there's like no certification, whatever. So, for example, um, where do where does somebody go if they want to? turn this into a career if they want to study this if they want to you know learn about this particular area what's what's the best avenue no, so, yeah so eugene there is a certification you actually uh, go to university and you get a degree in and, and an honors and a master's oh, okay but what sorry. they don't you know what they don't have in south africa is a professional body so if you're a medical doctor you you can register with the health professionals council if you're a lawyer you register with the bar um, but as far as criminologists go, there's no body to register with, um, mainly see. because of infighting with the universities. They can't even decide on what qualifications you need. So you, you they, and I, I mean, I have 20, 30 applications every week of people saying, can you, can, can I come and do an internship with you? Can I job shadow you? Can, but even that is difficult because again it's 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 those trust relationships you can't bring a young kid that's from university now into a job shadowing with a sensitive victim and and expect that victim to open up to you right um you know sometimes you, you it's difficult to do but cyberetti we we do everything that we can to assist with with upskilling and and to assist the police to assist the ngos anybody that reaches out to us we do these types of webinars um, you know, but 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 there are challenges, and 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 it's been for a long time. I mean, this has been going on for fifteen years, and it's the academics that can't get their their act together, really. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I know that in the traditional sense, most of the universities and schools that I know of are doing the traditional forensics, or or you know, which is you know the DNA and the anthropology and the the biology and the chemistry and you know maybe a little bit of some of the physical sciences but um uh very few of them are doing things on the uh, you know the e crimes let's call them uh side so it's it's almost like you have to come from a computer background as opposed to more of a, f a forensics background so I, I have to i'll have to do some research into that and see if there's anything for example in canada right now i i'm not aware of any programs that focus specifically on that yeah. yes and, and neither am i and that's why we are really trying sorry um, we are having um the lighting just changed i do apologize we are we have a little issue in south africa it's called load shedding where we don't have electricity for a couple of hours at a time <laughs> <laughs> which is a real a real challenge oh that's another challenge to south african profilers <laughs> face is no no power <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. um yeah so uh, you know that's another challenge in in this country for example even with trafficking because when all the electricity doesn't work then so many more opportunities open up for criminals right yeah for sure <laughs> so, um so, so i mean yeah. You, you mentioned but, training. Yeah, so to get back to what we were saying is the training. So that's what Cyberetti does. We focus very much on the training and the upskilling of, we start at primary school level and we do cyberbullying courses and we teach children how to approach online predation, 
how to reach out for help, how to how to put their uh, their, their WhatsApp settings, uh, security settings up, how to how to set their Facebook settings. Um, and then we, we move through to the cyber stalking aspects and the predation aspects. And then we, as I said, we train the police um, in, in, in these types of, 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 of crimes as well. So we're very, very focused on, on, on awareness, but also on actually providing hard skills to uh, the people that we train. We, I mean, we even do things like um, we work with an Israeli uh, law, uh, cyber lawyer who's one of the top crypto lawyers, and we will teach the police how to track um, the, the, an NFT on the blockchain, how to track Bitcoin on the blockchain, because with, as with anything else, following the money in, in, in these types of crimes, because it's organized crimes and syndicates, you have to follow the money to tie up the syndicate. Mm -hmm. um, so these are skills that are just in short supply, but we really focus at Cyberity on, on building these skills. And we do a lot of pro bono work. I do a lot of pro bono work for the courts because for me, um, it's, it's, I'm passionate about it. It's like, this has to stop. We've got to protect our kids. And, yeah. you know, people think that it's, that it's just girls. It's not, I mean, boy, boy, children now, um, represent 30% of the victims. 30% of children's trafficked at the moment are boys. And they're trafficked into sex trafficking. You know, it's a lot of the public doesn't realize that. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's everybody is vulnerable. And unfortunately, people are trusting. You know, people don't want to believe the worst of other people. And by the time they do, it's too late. They're trapped and they can't get out. Yeah, well, education, I think, is a big part of it, as you said, because and, and I think in a previous conversation that we had, you mentioned also, you know, sometimes victims, they don't know where to go or they fear the authorities. They, they don't know they, they don't either because of shame or, you know, they're they're afraid of being embarrassed or something. But uh, well, it's, many... it's, it's, it's more than that, because they are remember that they, they often find themselves in a different country of origin from their own. Their passports are confiscated. They're actually then illegally in the country because they have no documentation. In South Africa, especially, we've had a lot of xenophobic um, attacks, and 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 you know we have, we go through these xenophobic periods, and um, where where foreigners are targeted, and unfortunately, the police are not always kind, especially the police at station level. You know, once you move up the rank and you start to move with, into the specialized units it's different mm -hmm. but at station level and on the ground it's it's horrific for these people let me ask you about something that i think is important and we better i want to bring it up on screen here but it had to do with the advertising of uh you know or, or trying to tell the difference between what is a i'll say a legal ad online and something which is suspicious and i have these uh these, these graphics here that you provided me. And I, I'm not sure if you want to do them in any particular order, but um, maybe you can explain some of the differences of what to look for sometimes online in these ads. Yeah, so um, when a prostitute, a general prostitute um, advertises her services online, you'll see something like this ad that we have on screen now. Um, now, they... A, a, a prostitute working for herself can set limits. So she can say, I'm available from eight to five. Um, I don't I do BDSM. I am um, willing to do this and this and this. Um, so they set limits. Um, they often, the, the images that they, they put on are, are classy. They're, um, you know, that they, all their selfies a lot of the time because they're taken by them because it's all it's all willing. Um, with a traffic victim, you won't see that. Um, you you will see uh, degrading degrading images um, more than than you'll see um, these types of of classy type images. Um, there's a lot of um, things that you'll look for in a trafficked victim. 
Um, I'm quite happy to make these 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 graphics available as well, so we can we can actually put. I'll, I'll send you a word document which we can link in. But the things that you can look for in a traffic victim are, are keywords such as new in town, because what they do with traffic victims is they move them from town to town to town to town. So they'll only stay in a certain area for a short time, because once they've been used by that clientele, they're then bored with them. So they move them and they'll move a new set of girls in. So new in town is quite a common thing that you'll see. You'll also see sometimes new girl. Um, you'll also see any age accepted. Um, you'll see um, uh, any any no limits on what they'll offer. You'll see things like no law enforcement. Um, you'll see fresh. The word fresh comes up quite often. Um, snow bunny terms like that. Um, uh, here for a short time again, to, which pushes the. Um, that that you know that the girl they need to get in quickly because the girl will be moved in a short time. Um, if you look at the image that you've got there, uh, shoot, I don't actually have that image with me at the moment. But if you look at the the next image, the image of the actual trafficked victim, you will see that um, you can pick either of those two. So, so for example, there, you'll see that the imagery is much more graphic. It's, it's border, bordering on vulgar type imagery. It's, the image is taken usually by a third party and not by the victim themselves. Um, there's, the advert will say the subject is independent but the phone number will be attributed to many victims and not just one. Um, you'll also see that um, the images um, and the verbiage is present and the description or the categories that they prepare to enter into are much greater. Um, you'll see in this one, for example, they only speak Russian and Ukrainian. Now, of course, with the war, we've seen a massive increase in Ukrainian victims because they're vulnerable at the moment. Um, although, and that you'll see that that victim is advertised in Poland, but she speaks Russian and Ukrainian and very little German. So that's, that, that would be a, something to look for. Um, they also will advertise the sexual services in other destination countries, say as, as, for example, she'll be in Germany in a few months. Um, if you look at them, they also have often have physical marks on the body because often they are beaten up. Um, they also often look malnourished. They look very stressed. Um, they usually say these victims are available 24-7 um, and that they are willing to travel. Um, the subject is usually advised to as a call-in only um, and often they'll blur the victim as face so the face won't be visible because they have to do that because there's reverse image search tools that will search for that victim's facial features um, and then also you know they may advertise uh, medically risky services like anal you know all the anals and the bds's mm -hmm. uh, the SMs and things like that so um, these are things that you can look for as members of the public. So if you see these types of advertisements where the victim is being degraded, that's a very good indicator. Um, and then Eugene, I don't know if you've got the other slide there. Um, there's some interesting things there that we can just quickly have a look at. And that's the emoji indicators. Um, which is another very interesting one because a lot of the the traffic victims and the online ads have certain emojis that are used to portray uh, certain products. <laughs> we Amazing. wouldn't say, yeah, we you know they refer to as product. Um, so there you would use like a pink flower or a pink heart for a young boy or a minor or a child or a young girl. Um, if they move on the move, they'll put an aeroplane. If they're under a pump or a trafficker's control, they'll have the crown. Um, if you've got, you know, there's a whole bunch there that you can actually see. There's symbols for a two-goal special, a, a snow bunny, a, a penis, oral sex. 
So that's often just depicted with the emoji. But the trafficker, the 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 the, the Johns, the actual buyer, are very well aware of of these um, indicators. Wow. So wow. they are, de as I said, I'm more than happy to put this in a Word document and make it available, and we can add it into the links because this is something where the public can actually really, really assist a lot um, because. I mean, you guys are on the web a, a lot and, and you may be exposed to something like this. And if you are, I'm, I'm sure we're going to, sh um, we're going to sh uh, share Sabaretti's details, um, you know, and, 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 and you're welcome to get hold of us. If you notice this type of advert, uh, we, can, we can point law enforcement to it very, very quickly um, and, and we can track. So um please do keep a lookout for for these types of 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 um advertisements yeah. and this is surface web this is not dark web this is surface web twitter is a is a monster telegram it's all over the telegram groups uh tele telegram is basically trafficking world um so is twitter twitter has a huge amount of of human trafficking on it um facebook instagram um uh, tinder disaster for recruitment um yeah so basically all the social media sites are 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 uh, are, are um vehicles for for these types of adverts okay let me ask you what's 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 next for you in terms in this area are there are there any areas in particular that you're pursuing uh, much deeper um you know than than maybe some other areas or like what, what's what's next for you so we will continue to, I will continue to fight the fight as best I can. Um, I'll continue to work with, with, with the youth and upskilling them on the, on the cyber trafficking. Of course, I will continue with my expert witness testimony and the other criminal, you know, the criminogenic work that I do. Um, I will help law enforcement the best I can. Um, I also do a lot of commercial work where we assist people that are victims of sex extortion and these types of crimes, um, which I'll continue to do. I am on a little mission at the moment, however, because I'm trying to upskill myself on the OS insight so that I don't have to be as reliable on the techies as I am at the moment. So I'm, I'm doing my best to become a semi-techie. <laughs> I think it would probably take me a few years, but I'm working on that. Um, and also just I, I upskill permanently. So I'm always doing courses in psychology and, you know, I try to do two or three courses every every month just to upskill and learn something new every day. Because I think for all of us, as long as one day isn't wasted, um, you know, we move forward with our life. And I think knowledge is power. And I'm on a quest to to have more and more knowledge. Yes, definitely. Well, I want to uh, send out the, uh, th this is the uh, link to your website. It's cyberready.com and, and there's a contact uh, page there. So you could go there and uh, th your, there's an email address, I guess, where people can reach out to you. Uh, would it be okay if I showed your LinkedIn account as well? Yes, absolutely. Okay. My LinkedIn's there. Yeah. There's, there's Laurie. The company's so she... LinkedIn's there. Yep. Yeah, there, there it is. So you can also reach out, I guess, there. Then people can message you or get a hold of you if they want to talk to you about a case or if they want to talk about training and that sort of thing. Um, they can always, uh, yeah, yeah, reach you somehow. You're, you're available. Yes, absolutely. And oh. as I said, if they need technical assistance, we're, we're more than happy to, to pass them along to Alyssa. Um, she does an awesome job on the tech side. So. Yeah, just make contact with me and, and we'll make sure that you end up with somebody that can actually assist. Excellent. Well, look, I want to thank you very much uh, for this informative talk. It's it's uh, not something that I've really addressed before. And uh, there's a lot going on on the cyber side. I was There's a lot uh, recently that looking online about the, the growth of not just cyber trafficking, but just cyber crimes in general. They're just going off the charts because everyone is online these days and the criminals are getting smarter and smarter about you know, how they are getting you. And uh, I can't stand it because I can't get, you know, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, junk emails and, and calls and texts. And now they're just, uh, there's just so much. Everyone's getting bombarded with garbage. And you know that if you just one day inadvertently click on the wrong link mm -hmm. 
or something, you know, it's, it's going to mess you up for a long time, you know? Well, we work, we work with that. So if people have problems and they're worried about their general cybersecurity, we, we have developed some checklists. So if you do get a hold of me, um, we can send you the checklists that you can actually do the tests, get a score, see where you're vulnerable and where you at least need to start to fix things. Um, you know, we've developed checklists around business risk, about digital re reputation risk. So basically everything um, to do with, with protecting yourself online. So, yeah, just get a hold of us and, and, and we'll help. And if we can't help, we'll find somebody who can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Laurie, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, do me a favor. Hang back for a second because I want to come back and just chat with you for a little bit. But yeah, I, I really appreciate your time. And <laughs> I, I think in the future, we'll, we'll have you back maybe with Alyssa and, and uh, talking more about the, the technical tools and, and uh, other things uh, around just cyber crimes. Thank you for having me. And to everybody that popped in and listened to the chat, thank you for all your time and patience. And I hope the talk was at least informative and maybe we saved a life today. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Thank you. All right, folks, that does it for episode 85. We are going to be back next week and my guest is going to be Roberto King. I want to thank everybody in the chat window there. There were definitely a few people with some interesting questions and comments. So uh, yeah, I wish you all a happy Thursday and hopefully we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.